Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this. Yes, it's a Commodore 1702 monitor. I think this video is gonna be a little bit of a love letter from me to this monitor because I absolutely love this monitor. Now this one, it works, but it's got a fault. So we're gonna take a look at that and see if I can get that fixed and do another little mod to this thing to make it even better. So without further ado, Let's get right to it. If you're a regular watcher to my channel, you know that I absolutely love Commodores. It was my very first computer, it was a Commodore VIC-20, and I actually never had a Commodore 64, but at this point in my life, I love those things. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of repairs on the channel and I, I actually use my 64, well, one of my 64s, all the time because even in 2022 and while well, 2023, when you're watching this now, there are still new pieces of software games and things being made for the Commodore 64 to this day. Now, when you look at this monitor, of course, this thing screams Commodore 64. It's got the exact same coloring as a 64. Well, the 64 itself doesn't have this darker color, but the brown color here is exactly the same color as the 64 bread bin. But if you can believe it, this monitor actually didn't come out until after the 64 was released. I can't actually find any good concrete information about when the monitor was released, but the thing is about this monitor, which makes it so special, is that it actually has Luma Chroma inputs on the back, which is basically the precursor, well, it is the same thing, as the S-Video standard that Super VHS brought to market. Now, the 64 itself wasn't the very first computer to be released that had a Luma Chroma output on it. The Atari 800 was. And in fact, the earliest Commodore 64s when they came out, they didn't even have the Luma Chroma output. They only had composite output. Well, I think it had a Luma output, but no Chroma output. This monitor does have facility on the back to take Luma Chroma input or S-Video, although it doesn't use the little DIN jack that you might be familiar with. It uses two RCA connectors. I'm assuming that when the revision of the Commodore 64 motherboard came out that had the Luma Chroma output on the DIN jack, this monitor was released at the same time. What's amusing, if we take a look at the actual Commodore 64 box, it shows this person here using an Amdek color monitor, not a Commodore branded monitor, because I think at the time this artwork was made, which I think was early on, because if you look at that tape drive there, that looks pretty old. Commodore hadn't yet released the 1702 monitor or 1701, which was the precursor to this. Looking on the back of the box, we once again have the Amdek color monitor here and here. And then these shots actually look like a VIC-20 that's being used. And that looks like some type of a European monitor. I don't think anything in North America was ever sold that looked like that. Turning our attention back to the 1702, what makes it such a great monitor is that it's such a workhorse. This has a relatively low resolution CRT, but because of that, you have an extremely vibrant and bright picture. And because you're not having to crank the brightness of the contrast way up to get a usable picture on this, it means that the CRT on these is pretty long lived. So even if the monitor got a lot of use over the years, in general, the picture is still gonna be really good. Now I keep talking about the monitor being a 1702 and that's exactly what this monitor is. But the 1702 and the 1701 before it were both identical looking on the outside and generally perform exactly the same. The only real difference is that there were some redesigning of the circuitry inside the monitor, which means that there are actually two different schematics for the North American versions of these two monitors. Now, speaking of the design of the monitor, there's not a lot of information about the aesthetics design, like who came up with this, if this was Commodore or someone else, but the monitor itself, the North American ones for sure, are all made by JVC. And a little known fact is that JVC actually sold an OEM version of this monitor that looked identical, except instead of the Commodore badge here, it just said JVC. And there were some other small differences like no front inputs, different color power button, and a different set of inputs on the back here because the JVC monitor was targeted at the broadcast and professional market. In fact, if you take a look at the badge on the back of the JVC monitor, it actually says for commercial use only. Now, I don't know how much Commodore had to do with the way the monitor looked on the front, other than, of course, this color, which matches the Commodore 64 exactly. But clearly this back panel was borrowed or taken from a TV set because this notch and this hole in the black plastic here is clearly designed to mount a TV antenna for reception. And this panel right here would allow JVC to, instead of having video inputs here, have the regular RF inputs for a TV tuner. 
if you have a 1702 or 1701 and you want to check to see if it's made by JVC, it actually says it right here, the Victor Company of Japan, which is exactly what JVC is. My friend Frank in Italy has worked on a few of these, and he says in PAL markets, there are actually two manufacturers of this set. One is JVC and another is Toshiba, and he's worked on both. He told me that the PCBs inside the monitor were completely different between those two brands, but the exterior look of the monitor was identical. This particular monitor was made in July 1984. I don't actually know how long Commodore was selling these monitors, but I think by the time the Commodore 64C came out, which of course had the creamy light color case, they had released the 1802 monitor, which was aesthetically similar looking to those computers. And I actually don't know who makes those. I've had a couple come through the basement, but I actually prefer the 1702s for a couple of reasons. One is that the industrial design of these just, it looks awesome and so 80s. But I also love how it has this big flat top, which means you can actually stack these monitors on top of each other, which is just convenient if you have more than one. My assumption is though, once they started selling the 1802 monitors, there was actually a couple different versions of it, they probably discontinued the 1702. Thing is, I was able to find pictures of the JVC variant of this with dates on the back all the way up until 1989, which is definitely after Commodore surely would have discontinued this monitor. Now, if you run across these monitors in the wild, or you happen to have yours from when you were young, the most common Achilles heel of the monitor is that the door breaks off very easily. And you need to be very careful with the door if you still have one that's intact like this. Typically, it's these little clips in here that do break, and then the door falls off. And I think back in the day, a lot of people would just toss them out and not keep them, which means there's a lot of 1702 monitors around these days that are missing the door. In fact, I have a couple like that. And it's hard to 3D print a new door because of the large size of this, not to mention sometimes when the door is missing, there's a little plastic clip on the monitor here that's actually on the body of the monitor and that breaks off as well, especially if you're like carrying a monitor or something. And that little tab there is necessary because when you close the door, it pushes out on the door and holds it up. If you put a complete door like this onto a monitor that's missing that little tab, what happens is the door won't stay closed and will just flop open. Now, when we look inside the monitor here, there is a nice set of controls besides the usual brightness, contrast, color tint. Tint, of course, for North America, you wouldn't have that in PAL markets. Additionally, you have a horizontal position, a vertical hold, and the volume control right here. There are additional controls for the monitor, but they're inside the back cover. Now, as I'd mentioned, these monitors often got a second life in people's bedrooms hooked up to a VCR so they could be used as a television set or even in a TV production studio. In fact, I bought my Amiga 4000 from a gentleman who used to do video editing, and he used two of these with his video toaster as the program and preview monitors. I've also used these monitors a lot myself, and they are just so robust and so well designed. They have a very good power supply with good regulation, good high voltage power supply as well so you get a nice stable picture. Cheap TVs and monitors have a lot of distortion depending on what's on the display, but the 1702 monitor, because it's so well made, is not susceptible to a lot of those problems. There are a couple other small problems with this monitor. I wouldn't call them problems, but they're minuses when you think about the pros and the cons about the monitor. The phosphor in use on the CRT is quite light, and as you can see here under the studio lights, well, there's not a lot of contrast ratio. If you have a computer display image here, you'll be able to see it, like it's gonna be nice and bright. But the problem is the black sections of the picture aren't gonna look very black with the lights on because of how light the phosphor is. If you just compare it to the Toshiba television set that's sitting next to this thing, you can see that there's a huge difference in the color of the phosphor and the Toshiba TV there will have much better contrast ratio while used in bright environments. I think partially there are two reasons for that. The phosphor itself is a different formulation that is a bit darker when it's not being energized, but also on a lot of these later TVs, they actually tinted the front glass, which did reduce the overall brightness, but it also uh, made a better contrast ratio. And I think they just figured that you would just turn the brightness up a little bit more to compensate for that tinted glass, and it was worth the trade-off to have the additional contrast ratio. The other negative is that the audio video input on the front is the composite video input and on the back of the monitor is the Luma Chroma input. And there's a switch right here to select between those. So if you're plugging in something like a Nintendo or a normal VCR, you have to have the wires run out of the front here around to the back, which can be a little unsightly. We're actually gonna address that in this video. I'm gonna be testing this monitor in a moment and I'll be using the Tektronix signal generator. This is a Tektronix TSG-130A. But before we actually power this thing up, let's take the back cover off and take a look inside. 
Removal of the back cover is easy because the screws are all easily accessible and the monitor stands up nicely on its own without the back cover installed since it has this pretty square case. The usual caveats apply to opening a monitor. Please do not open a monitor unless you know how to be safe inside. Some of the voltages that are in there, especially the mains voltage if you have it plugged into the wall, can be lethal. So please be careful. Alrighty, I think the back cover is off. Now the cord is fixed, at least in North America, so I do have to feed this through the opening in the back cover. Now, when we take a look inside the monitor, it's gonna give us a good indicator, potentially, of how much use this monitor has seen. What is not an indicator to how much it's been used, of course, is all the dust that's sitting on the bottom of the case, because that would have just fallen through these vents on the top and settled on the bottom. Incidentally, we have some warning stickers in here, and one of them says, high voltage is not adjustable. Normally, high voltage is 22 to 24 kV. What generates all that high voltage is the flyback transformer right here, and that comes through this high voltage cable into the CRT. The CRT is like a giant capacitor, with that connection to the CRT being the anode. There's actually another little tidbit about the 1702, which I find kind of interesting. There are actually two versions of the 1702. 1702 regular and the 1702T. And this appears to be the 1702T. I don't actually know what the difference is. I assume there's just some subtle changes on the PCB between those two revisions. I've actually never looked inside a 1701, but I'm assuming the external case is basically identical, but the layout of the PCB is quite different because if you check the schematics from Commodore for the NTSC versions of these, you can see that the PCB layout, while it's similar, the components are quite a bit different between the two versions. Looking at the topology of this monitor, this PCB right here, and it's, it's gonna be hard to see on camera, but there's actually a split in the PCB. It's a separate PCB. That is the entire power supply section for the monitor. I think the North American version of this monitor just employs some transistors to bleed current into this heatsink. And that's because the B plus voltage of this monitor is I think 125 volts, which is quite close to the mains voltage here in the US. So once it's converted from AC to DC, then you have what, like 160 volts or 155 volts or so, and you just have to bleed off that extra voltage to get down to the 125 volts DC that this monitor runs off of. Now the other PCB, of course, this is the circuitry that actually is generating the high voltage. It's handling the horizontal and vertical deflection, and it's probably also handling some amount of video decoding. There are several controls on the PCB. I see three there, two more there. There's a service switch right there, which will uh, turn off the vertical deflection for adjustments. Uh, so those are there, and I think the schematic, uh, there's actually markings on the PCB, like that one says V height, for instance. And then this little box right here could be a tripler, but it's probably not. It's probably just a voltage divider. This wire here comes from the flyback, that would be the high voltage, like 25,000 volts, and it goes into this thing, and then out comes the high voltage to the CRT, which is this wire right here. But these other wires here are high voltage still, but they're less than 25,000 volts. One of them is gonna be the focus voltage that's controlled by the uh, potentiometer there, and the other one is gonna be green voltage, which goes to one of the grids on the CRT, which is controlled by the other pot, and there'll be some kind of like wrist resistor divider inside this little box here for that. There may also be a high voltage diode in here because there does need to be a diode somewhere. The flyback generates AC and being a capacitor, the CRT, it needs DC. So somewhere there's gotta be a diode. Sometimes it's in the flyback itself, but it also could be inside this little box here as well. And then we have the neck board plugged into the back of the CRT. And this takes the video signals that come off that PCB down there, which will be like the decoded NTSC signals and turn those into cathode drive for the various cathodes inside the CRT, the RGB basically. Now I know I'm gonna get the question, how hard would it be to RGB mod this particular TV set? Problem is, it's probably not super simple. It's not impossible, but it's not simple. The reason why is the RGB signals that come out of a computer like an Amiga are usually like 0.7 volts peak to peak. And then the RGB signals that come off this main board down here that go into this to drive the CRT are not 0.7 volts to zero volts peak to peak. They're probably more like 50 volts peak to peak or 30 volts peak to peak, something like that. So you need to design a circuit that would convert the RGB signals from your console or your computer to the voltages that this thing is expecting. There may also be linearity curves in the RGB signals that feed this board from the ICs on the board that are tuned for this particular CRT to give the best possible response curves from darkest to lightest. So you'd either need to replicate those if you were building your own circuit, or you just have to live with the fact that the linearity might not be perfect for the response curves of the different colors. 
On this board, there are integrated circuits that take the composite NTSC video and also the Luma Chroma video, and they convert that into RGB at the right levels that are required for this neck board. Okay, I've done enough talking and we're ready for some testing. I have the test pattern generator connected here to the front video input because I'm just running this over composite. And let's power this thing up. Now, I think we should have a pretty good image as it comes up, there it is. And yes, it looks totally fine. The problem I've seen with this monitor is that after a minute or two, you get some arcing from the high voltage side on the <laughs> around the flyback or, or something. I don't know actually, because I didn't have the back cover off when this was happening. So yeah, what a wonderful, super bright image. In fact, I'm gonna turn it down a little bit because it seems almost too bright. I'd have to say it's pretty good, the image. I haven't done any calibration to this monitor at all. I'm gonna say that probably the red is a little bit too hot. So everything has a little bit of a red tint, including the yellow there. But now I'm gonna let this sit and I wanna see if it has that arcing problem. I have another camera set up on the back of the monitor and it is recording. So if anything sparks back there, hopefully we will see what happens. Well, that's annoying. I let this thing run for about an hour with both cameras pointing at it, this one on the front and the other camera at the back with of course the cover removed, hoping to see some fireworks, but there was nothing. The thing just worked perfectly for the whole time. And I can tell you that the first time I turned this thing on, it arced a couple times in maybe the first five or 10 minutes and they were really loud pops as well. And when I did it, the picture would go off. It was almost like if you turn the power off and then back on again. That's what the arc looked like. Now that is normal because you have to remember that the flyback transformer on these types of monitors is what generates all the various voltages that runs the various aspects of the monitor. So when you experience an arc on the high voltage side, what's happening is all the high voltage is draining away, probably to ground or something like that, which actually brings all of the voltage rails on the flyback transformer down to, well, much lower than they need to be. So it's kind of the equivalent of just turning off the monitor. But very quickly, the monitor starts back up again, and that's why it, it has this look that kind of looks like that. Okay, so my next steps, I think, because this thing didn't arc, is I'm gonna turn this thing off, and I'm gonna take this outside, and I'm gonna give it a good air dusting. There's quite a lot of dust in the back of that thing, and I wanna check a few things just to make sure that the monitor is operating within spec. I was giving a little thought last night to what might be going on with this, with the arcing. And of course, as you can tell by the wardrobe chain, it's, it's the next day. And I was thinking that if the B plus voltage on the monitor was excessively high, like say the voltage regulation wasn't working quite right, then that could actually produce excessive high voltage. Now, typically on a monitor like this, there's actually a circuit that can detect the excessive high voltage and actually shuts down the monitor. Excessive high voltage can actually result in x-rays uh, from a CRT like this. I mean, I don't know, it has to be really excessive for that to happen, but there should be circuitry in here to protect against that. But perhaps it's a few kilovolts too high, and maybe with all the dust in there, that actually allowed some arcing to happen, maybe where the anode cap is on the back of the CRT to the DAG ground, something along those lines. Hmm, you know what, I just had a thought. Before I take this outside to clean the dust off, I'm gonna actually do a close inspection around the high voltage areas to look for any signs of arcing. You can sometimes see telltale signs of burning or witness marks in the dust from any arcing that's happened in the past. I mean, I can guarantee you that this had some arcing, but I don't know if this monitor had been used back in the day and it was put out of service because it was arcing, or maybe that was just a fluke where we had a couple arcs and I shut it off. So there may not be any marks from that. So let's take a look. Okay, so for the inspection, I'm gonna use a flashlight here to just shine extra light, but I have the studio light as well shining down the monitor and it's sitting on the turntable so I can easily move it back and forth. Now, when we look at sources of high voltage, we already talked about this a little bit, but the flyback transformer generates high voltage, comes out of this lead here, goes down into this thing, which we already talked about, and it comes out this red wire and it goes up to the high voltage anode cap up there. Now there is quite a lot of like soot on this stuff, which is indication that this thing has a good number of hours on it. Here, if I wipe my finger right there, see how it's sort of black that comes off? That, that is a very fine dust that's attracted by the fact that this thing has such a high voltage potential on it all the time. If you have something like an ionizer in use in your house, you might notice another similar fine dust around everything with that as well. And I think it's something similar that causes it. The black soot dust is quite different than this dust that you see all, all over the PCV down here, which is just simply dust that came through the top of the case and settled on the board. 
Now I'm paying special attention to these connections here on uh, this voltage divider for the focus and the screen, just to see if there's any, any signs of arcing there. There's actually a ground lead right here. This is a ground lead, but it's connected to uh, this wire here, this yellow one, which is the lowest voltage potential of all of them. These red ones over here are the highest voltage and that's the furthest away from the ground point. Down here on the flyback transformer, this part of the metal chassis right here is also equivalent of ground, and so is this metal strap here, along with, uh, there's another one on the other side right there, you can't really see it. But it's pretty close right here to the high voltage output. So potentially, you know, if the voltage were high enough, it could jump this gap right here. Now the gap is pretty large, and because uh, there's this rubber insulation or silicone insulation on here, that means that it would need to break through that insulation or it would need to be something wrong with that insulation, like a crack in the boot here that could potentially allow it to jump. But to be honest, everything on the flyback here just looks like it's in really good shape. The cables seem soft and supple and I don't see any cracks or evidence of damage of any kind. So, so far, there's just no evidence that there is anything wrong here. When I was running the monitor for an hour waiting for it to arc, I had the camera pointed at the back of the CRT and of course I had the lights off. So if there was an arc, then we should have seen a flash from that area. Like, so if it was up here or down there, it would have allowed us to try to zero in on the area inside the monitor where the fault is. But unfortunately, well, we just didn't get what we needed. Alrighty, so the visual inspection didn't result in any useful, well, indicators of where a fault might lie. So I'm gonna go clean this up outside. All right, with the air compressor, I was able to make this whole thing look a whole lot cleaner inside, which is good because now I can actually read some of the markings on the PCB if I have to make any further adjustments. Now I have the schematics up on the screen here and I'm gonna need to use the multimeter to check that B plus voltage or B1 as it's called on this monitor. So I'm gonna remove these screws on the front here. I think there are two with arrows pointing to them and I think that's gonna free the chassis and allow it to slide out of the monitor just so I can access things a little bit more easily for testing purposes. All right, with those screws out of the front, I think, yep, the whole chassis is just loose in here now. Now I'm not gonna pull it out completely because I don't wanna disconnect these wires and stuff, but it's gonna allow me easier access to the power supply here so I can clip on and get the voltage reading that I need. All right, so I have the service manual open. It's very easy to find. Just type in 1702 service manual. And right away at the start, it tells you how to check for the B1 or the B plus voltage on the monitor. Now notice the 1701 actually runs at 110 volts, but the 1702 runs at 125. Scrolling down through the document, you can find the schematic for the 1702 specifically, not the 1701. Make sure you're looking at the right one. Here's the power supply board for the 1702. And one thing I'm noticing right off the bat is that there is no adjustment for the B plus voltage. It actually is regulated by this IC right here, which I think on the 1701, it uses a variable resistor or potentiometer to do the adjustment, which is a bit more normal for monitors from the early 80s. So this is one of the improvements that they did with this monitor. Taking a look at the basic topology of the power supply, the mains voltage comes in, goes through a fuse, goes through a power switch, and then it actually splits off. Part of it goes through this large bridge rectifier here, which is gonna be generating the B plus voltage, and that goes into this uh, IC here, which is the voltage regulator. There is a large resistor, which I know you can't easily see, but it's actually tucked back there. It's a large power resistor that's used to bleed off that extra voltage. And you notice here, if I zoom up a little bit, 148 volts, that's the DC that actually makes its way to this resistor. And then what comes out of it is 125 volts, which is the B plus. This IC on pin three is grounded. And you notice that the ground symbol is like a little upside down Christmas tree. And that's gonna be different than the other ground on the monitor. And that's to keep this monitor from being a live chassis and actually have an isolated design. We'll get to that in just a second. From this IC, you'll see the 125 volts come off, which is thick wire. And that circle means that it's leaving that PCB and it's actually making its way over to the main PCB here. So this is the thick wire. And if we trace that wire, it goes all the way over here, right to the flyback transformer. Going back to the flyback, you see all these resistors right here with these little arrows and there is focus and screen. That is actually this component right here with these two adjustment knobs that generates the voltages for the focus and the screen, which goes up to the back of the CRT on the neck board here. Other things that come off the flyback transformer right here, the CRT heater. There's also the neon lamp, which I think is a little indicator light on the front of the monitor. That actually is generated off the flyback transformer as well. There is also this winding right here, which makes its way 12.5 volts. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna be for like the audio circuitry on the monitor. 
And if we follow it up here, yep, there it is, audio circuitry. So the audio amplifier is even powered from the flyback. So that's what I'm saying that if you have an arc that's happening around the high voltage on the flyback, it actually makes all those voltage rails go away, which basically shuts down the monitor temporarily until it can come back to life and regenerate all those voltage rails. Now, coming back to the power supply circuit, you can also see the mains comes down here and it goes through a power transformer. So this is gonna bring that 125 volt mains down to something much lower. It goes through another bridge rectifier, obviously a much smaller one than this large one right here. And then that makes its way over to the monitor. And notice the ground symbol, it's almost like a little brush as opposed to a little upside down Christmas tree. And that's a different ground rail that is on the entire chassis of the monitor here. When you look at the back of the monitor, the metal chassis right here and even the grounds on the RCA connectors is actually that little brush ground symbol that comes from the power transformer and the power transformer is right there. So that is what creates the isolated design that makes it safe to plug a video input connection into this monitor. I haven't done a lot of analysis, but I'm pretty sure that those voltage rails here are what drive these ICs that do all the video decoding on the monitor because of course those are handling the video signals. In fact, yeah, check out the ground pin there, nine on the IC. It's got the little brush symbol versus the little Christmas tree symbol. In fact, we look at the thick wire here. This is gonna be the 125 volts, goes into the flyback, goes through this winding right here. And you can see here there's a diode and also comes up here and it comes down along here. And there it is, there's the Christmas tree ground. And there it is as well, there's a bypass cap. So yeah, there's gonna be some traces on this board, especially over in the power supply section with the Christmas tree ground. And because this monitor, if I get the cord here, only has a two prong plug. It does not have a, a grounded outlet. And that means you could plug this in backwards if you have, well, it's a polarized plug, but if you had a plug that was incorrectly wired, you could plug this in the opposite way. And then the Christmas tree here, which you know is marked ground on the, the schematic, would actually become 120 volts. So that means that parts of this monitor could be considered a non-isolated or live chassis set, specifically the high voltage section. But the drive circuitry for the high voltage section, I bet you is gonna have the brush ground. So if we look here, this is the horizontal output transistor and you can see it has the Christmas tree ground. So that's the non-isolated ground. But if we look right here, this is the horizontal drive transformer, the HDT. And that essentially isolates the sections of the board. This is the drive circuitry that drives the transformer and is driven by all the ICs that do like the sink separation, stuff like that. And you can see that has the brush ground or the isolated ground. So really the reason why I'm talking about this really has nothing to do with trying to make this monitor work or whatever. It's just, I'm trying to explain the difference between an isolated design of a monitor or a television set versus a non-isolated design. Some of the sets that I work on down here in the basement, like the little cheap black and white sets from the late 70s into the 80s, they don't have this separate little transformer here, meaning all of the supply rails inside the TV are derived from the B+, which is a non-isolated design, even like on this monitor, which means the entire set is not isolated. And that's why it's not easy or safe to just add a composite input to those things. Because if you have an incorrectly wired outlet or you plug the cable in backwards, then what is the RCA ground on your newly added composite would become mains referenced, in other words, 120 volts. That would not be good, especially if you're plugging it into a computer because all of the metal grounded parts of the computer would also be 120 volts. Anyhow, I digress, that was a little diversion. Let's get back to checking the B plus voltage on this monitor just to make sure that it's the correct 125 volts. Back here at the beginning of the manual, it just says check that IC901 pin four is 125 volts, doesn't really tell you much else to do. But if we look here, pin four, 125 volts, is also the same thing as measuring on uh, their test point 94, which is the red wire on the large power resistor. Now it's not gonna be easy to see, but that right there is the uh, power IC that does the regulation and pin three in the middle is what I have my black multimeter wire here clipped onto. And hopefully you can just make out that this is the large power resistor and I have the other lead connected to the red wire, which should be 125 volts. And there we have it. I just turned on the monitor, 125.49 volts. So I guess it's 0.5 volts high, but I don't think that's a problem. That is pretty accurate and it's cool that it's not adjustable because that's an adjustment that if you mess it up, you can cause problems with your monitor, especially if you turn it up too high or too low, of course. 
Now that we know the B plus is actually good, 125 volts, that means that the high voltage should be completely within spec because it's completely derived from the B plus. But I'm still gonna measure it anyways. I'm gonna do it a little bit different than I normally do it. I'm gonna use this probe right here, which is a Tektronix high voltage probe, good for up to 40,000 volts as a thousand to one ratio, meaning I'm gonna use my multimeter here to get an accurate measurement, a very accurate measurement, better than the typical high voltage probe that I usually use, which just has a little analog meter on it, which has very low accuracy. This should have a very high accuracy. The tip right here is what I have to get under the anode cap to make contact there to get an accurate measurement. And there is also a ground lead that comes off of this, which you need to connect to the CRT ground, which I have connected right here on the neck board, which actually has a ground wire that runs its way to the CRT over here to the DAG. Alrighty, so with the CRT working, I should be able to get this under here. I might need to use a little plastic tool to lift up the rubber a little bit. Alrighty, so there we go. I have a good connection and you can see we're at 22.93 volts. That means we're actually at 23,000 volts and the monitor is specced up to 24,000 volts. So we're actually a thousand volts under which is good, that means we're not running hotter than this thing should. If we were seeing something like 27 on here or 30, that would be 27 or 30,000 volts, which is clearly too high. And since the monitor was only designed for up to 24,000, then maybe some of the high voltage insulation on this area here might've been breaking down a little bit and leaking and then allowing for arcs. But this seems completely within spec, so we're all good. Now, one thing I can also do is poke around on the outside and see if we get any readings on here. So remember, if we had a one volt reading, that would be 1000 volts. And right now we're not really getting anything here. I'm just trying to see if, you know, there's some kind of leakage or something, but no, there is nothing. How about over here? Nothing at all. I can hear little bits of static electricity, which of course is what's attracting all that, uh, that black sooty dust. This is just nothing. We're not even getting like 300 volts. It's like 30 volts, stuff like that is what's being measured. Now, just for fun, let's take a look at the screen voltage, which is the yellow wire right here. And there we see 700 volts. That's what screen is set to right now. And if I turn the potentiometer on the voltage divider, that will change that screen voltage. I'm not sure what the spec should be, but it's at 700 right now. But just know that there are high voltages on the back of this neck board here, like the 700 volts on this pin right here. And you could get a little bit of a wallop if you accidentally touch that. The final little fix I wanna to do to the monitor is about the rear versus front video audio inputs on the 1702. This is the rear panel, which has a selector for either front or rear. And because I'm using a composite input on this thing right now, I have to plug it in to the front of the monitor. Commodore labels the Chroma Luma input as Commodore video, but really it's just S video as I mentioned earlier. And there is an audio input on the back as there is on the front. Now, as it stands right now, if I switch the switch here, we just lose the picture entirely. And I don't totally love that. I kind of wish that the front or back inputs would work and that the switch on the back was simply a switch to turn off and on the Luma Chroma separate video versus the composite. My personal preference is that I would rather be able to hook the composite up to the back or the Commodore video up to the back and the front inputs would just be optional, so to speak. Now let's look at the schematics to see how this rear switch thing works. And here it is right there, the AV input assembly. So what you see in this box here is actually the slider switch and the little black lines here move between these two pins and these two pins and it does it on all four of these contact areas. So it's actually doing more than just switching between the front and rear inputs because when you use the rear Luma Chroma or Commodore video input, the image is actually a lot sharper. And that's possible because composite video, when you have the color information and the video information overlaid on top of each other, you'll get an interference pattern unless you have a 3.58, I think it's 3.58 megahertz trap filter that filters out the dot pattern. Without the trap filter, when you look at the color bars here, you would see this dot pattern across all of them. Now, it's actually slightly visible right now on the monitor. That's because the trap filter that it's using isn't super strong. But if that trap weren't there at all, you would actually see a lot more of the dots. So let's break down what this switch is actually doing. First thing we're gonna do is look at the audio. So here's the audio input on the back of the monitor and it goes to this pin. And here's the audio input on the front panel and it goes to this pin. So when you move the switch back and forth, it can select which one is actually hooked up. The middle pin of all of these positions goes to the circuitry on the monitor. In fact, it's going over here to the audio amplifier. 
thing is when you take a look at the audio, for whatever reason, they actually have both the front and the rear input connected together. So you don't actually have to use the audio on the front at all. You could just connect it on the back and it would work no matter what switch position you're in. I actually don't know why Commodore did it that way, but they did for whatever reason. Next, let's look at the Luma input. So Luma is, of course, just the monochrome video signal without the color information encoded into it. But it's also very similar to the composite video because it also has all the sync signaling and whatever else is inside a video signal in it. It's just simply missing the color information. So the Luma on the rear input, which would just be the monochrome image, comes in and goes to this pin here on the left. The front video input here goes to the pin on the right and the little black bar will move between them and connect it to this center pin, which is labeled A1. And that is what goes into the video amplification circuit here. Next up, there's the chroma input on the back and that connects to this pin, the middle pin. And if we trace that to here to B1, that's gonna go to this transistor right here, which is obviously for the chroma input. And it follows over to here and it goes into that uh, IC up here, which actually is the demodulator IC, the color demodulator. This is what's decoding the NTSC color and converting it to RGB. The demodulator output right here on pins one, two, and three is actually the RGB that makes its way all the way over to the neck board. And there it is, there's the neck board. So earlier in the video, when I talked about RGB modding a 1702, you'd have to put switches in line with these wires here that go to the neck board and then you would have to take the RGB signal from whatever computer or console you're hooking up and convert it to these similar levels that are going to be seen with these outputs. And we can see here 6.9 volts, 6.9, and 7.3. You'd have to use at least three transistors and some passives to actually do the level shifting and conversion to the correct RGB levels for this monitor. It's also possible that it would need to be inverted. The signals would need to be inverted uh, for the neck board. I don't know, maybe the neck board, I think it has some transistors as well. So it might be inverting the signals because the cathode drive on a CRT requires the signals to be inverted. When you have a signal down near ground, that's actually full brightness on the CRT and the higher the voltage is, the darker it gets. Anyhow, I digress. So the middle wire here, that's going to that demodulator circuit. And obviously we have the chroma input there, but what's coming from the left pin here on the chroma switch? Well, if we follow this down, it goes over there through B4, and it's connected here to this transistor. And what seems to be happening is there's some circuitry that involves this IC right here. And what's going on is it's actually taking the video signal, the composite video signal, and it's separating the color information, the chroma information, and it's coming out of this pin here. And then that is driving this transistor, which is actually sending that chroma information over to the switch and then that loops around and comes back through and into the demodulator. If this monitor didn't have that rear switch and it only had a regular composite input, almost certainly whatever is going on right here would just come out of this IC and then make its way over to the color demodulator. But really on this monitor, when you have a composite input hooked up to it, it's actually creating an S-video type signal or a chroma luma signal. And the chroma information is actually making its way all the way through that switch and then back into the monitor. It's looping around there so that when you flip the switch to use the separate chroma input on the back, it's actually breaking that signal and it's not taking that chroma information that's being separated. And it's just taking the chroma input that would be coming directly from your uh, computer or the VCR or whatever you have plugged in through the S-video type connection. The final signal is this one down here. And the middle pin, if we trace it, comes over to this IC over here, well, a transistor, and goes into this, this IC, which is gonna be handling the video processing on this monitor. And look right here, 3.58 megahertz trap. This is that trap filter I talked about that's gonna to try to remove that dot pattern. I think depending on whether the transistor is on or off will determine if this trap filter is in play. And if we go back to the switch, one of the switch positions is the dashed line here, which is about 12 volts. And the other one just goes right here to the brush ground, which is ground. So if you have a switch to the setting where you're gonna use the chroma input, which is like the chroma luma, you want a sharper image. And it's actually gonna be grounding that transistor, which through the circuitry that's right here, it should disable this trap filter. And it must also increase the sharpness or disable some of the softening that's going on with this IC to give you that nice sharp S video image. With a 1702 monitor, if you're using it with something like an Apple II, while the Apple II is in monochrome mode, so one of the text modes, it has no color signal. So the color killer circuit in the demodulator IC, which is right here, the killer detector, that'll disable the color decoding when there is no color burst. 
The problem is with this particular monitor, and actually this is not unique to the 1702, but it's one thing that the Apple Color monitors do, is on the Apple Color monitors, when the color color circuit is active, essentially you're outputting a monochrome signal from the Apple II, is it disables those softening and those filters, like the trap that we saw there, so you get a really nice sharp image and can display 80 column text. On this monitor, since the softening circuit is totally separate, the color killer has nothing to do with whether it's soft or sharp. Now, while the Apple II is in monochrome mode, if you plug it into the back of the monitor and you set it for Lumachroma, the, the separate mode, you're gonna get a nice sharper image with much crisper text. Now, one way to kind of fix that problem, but also fix the problem where the front of the monitor is only composite input and not the back, would be to simply copy what Commodore did with the audio circuit right here, where they bridged the two pins on the side of the switch. If we do that right here, what that'll do is it'll bridge the rear Luma connection with the front composite connection and turn that switch simply into one that enables the separate chroma input and also disables the softening and the trap filter on the video input signal. Looking at the back of the PCB that has the switch, you can see all the pins there that we see on the schematic. We just need to figure out which are the two, well, I'm holding up three, which are the two that we're gonna bridge together to bridge the back Luma and the front composite input together to add more capability and flexibility to this monitor. And really the easiest is just gonna be use the multimeter on continuity mode to figure out which is the Luma pin here. So that pin right there is coming from the RCA jack and it's going to the lower row on the bottom there. Now I'm gonna wager that this pin right here is the front input with the probe touching that. I'm just gonna stick the other probe inside the jack on the front of the monitor and bang, there we go. That is what we're looking for. So now I know which two pins are the front and the back inputs, this one right here and that one right there on the actual thing here. I'm just gonna grab a little piece of metal wire and solder it on there to make this mod to the monitor. It's very easy. Alrighty, there we have it. That's the little bodge wire I added. Incidentally, this header right down here, which has uh, these wires coming out of it, this is the selector switch that is right here, the 0, 1, 0, 2, and 0, 3. This is what turns on and off the filtering on the monitor. So another little mod we could do is add a little toggle switch, a separate one, and disconnect the wires here that go to this switch and allow us to selectively turn on and off the filtering. Now, ideally, you don't actually really want to do that because if you turn off the filtering while you're using composite video, you're going to get a very dot-filled picture. It's not really particularly useful. And if you turn on the filtering while you're on the S-Video or Luma Chroma mode, it's just going to needlessly soften the image for no reason that you don't need to do. It would almost be a mod you might want to do if you don't want to do what I just did, bridging the front and the back inputs together, if you wanted to make it where the composite mode could be sharper. For instance, if you're using an Apple II plugged into the front, you could toggle that separate switch, which would then be just switching this portion of the switch, which would then give you that sharper image. Anyhow, that's just more food for thought on potential mods on this monitor. All right, so let's test this out. Here is the composite video connector. I'm gonna move this to the back and plug this into the Luma input. Now it's still set to front on here. Let's turn this on and we should have a color image, which is what we were getting with it plugged into the front. There it is, looks good. Now, if I slide that switch on the back, what's gonna happen is remember, it's gonna disconnect the chroma. So it means we're gonna have a black and white image, but it's gonna be sharper. So we're gonna see that dot pattern on it. And there we go. So there's a little bit of chroma that's still coming through because you can see that there's still a tiny bit of color, but there is that dot pattern I was talking about. Bringing the camera a little bit closer, hopefully you can see that dot pattern that I'm talking about, but all those dots there with a little bit of a moray pattern. Now, if I open the front lid, actually, I'm just gonna turn the color down, which is color. There we go. So that's actually a bit desaturated now, but you still really see that dot pattern. And if I flip the switch again, there it is. The dot pattern is filtered out a little bit at least. It's still somewhat visible, but it's a lot better. Here is another good test. This is a resolution test. As the bars get closer to the right, they get closer and closer together. And you see over on this side, you see a little blue and red artifacting. And that's because as the lines get closer and closer together, they start to what emulate essentially what the color information is, which is, which is why you're not seeing a nice clear black and white image over here. If I move the toggle switch though, look at that. All of a sudden, it's nice and sharp here.
Now this particular test pattern generator does have S-Video output actually, but the composite output Luma portion of that signal is still very sharp, which is why once I flick the switch on here and we disable those filters, we're now getting a very nice sharp image here. Keep in mind the dot pitch on the 1702 is not good enough to enable 80 column text that's completely readable. But on the other hand, if you flick that switch, you're gonna get the best possible 80 column text, which should be somewhat readable. There is another test pattern on the generator here, which also has a resolution test getting from lowest to highest. And even with the monitor set for chroma, chroma luma and the filtering disable, over here we're still not seeing a lot of resolution. We have some moray patterns. And again, that is just the dot pitch going on. Let me grab a composite monitor and we can compare what we're gonna see on that. With the Apple IIc monochrome monitor, even though it's only nine inch, Absolutely, it's resolving information all the way over here on the right side. I can very clearly see bases between those vertical lines on this monitor. And back in the 80s, this was the choice you had between a nice vibrant color image, but a low dot pitch or something like this that offered incredibly sharp text and it was very readable. And one last comparison here is the Commodore 1084, and this is set for Loma, Luma Chroma mode, which is like S-Video, same thing now as flipping the switch on this. It disables the filters, but this has a much higher dot pitch CRT, which results in a much higher rendition of this particular test pattern. It's still not great, and you can see some Mori patterns. It's not nearly as good as the monochrome monitor, but it's a lot better than the 1702. And if I push the button on the back, which turns on the color decoding and also enables the filtering, there is the color interference pattern from the NTSC color decoding that will also happen on the 1702. But having a high resolution CRT like this has negatives and it's actually very apparent to me right now. It's not gonna come across on camera. The image is just much dimmer and less vibrant than it is on these types of CRTs. That is simply because the little spots of phosphor on here are smaller and there is more space between them because you remember there's a shadow mask that has to block the electron beams so they only hit the right color. The holes in the shadow mask are just much smaller because the spots on the front of the glass are smaller and overall it has to work harder to make as bright an image as this monitor does. Now both of these monitors are old, they've been used quite a lot but this one is basically turned up as bright as it can get, and it's still sharp, and it's very clear, but the overall brightness doesn't even compare to the 1702. And there it is, the 1702 is warmed up. Let's turn that one off because they're causing a bit of interference with each other. And yeah, I mean, it's not coming across in the camera because of the automatic iris and everything, but hopefully you can tell how much darker everything is around, like my hand. This thing is so bright, and to be honest, it's not even turned up all the way. The contrast knob, I have it turned down because it's so unbelievably bright. A brighter image means that you don't have to turn the brightness and the contrast up as high to get a usable picture, which means the CRT should last longer, which is why so many of these 1702s that I find are still in really great shape when from an image quality perspective, they're not worn out and dim. I have found many a 1084 that had their life used up out of them and they just had a dim and washed out image because the CRT itself was spent. Alrighty, I think that's gonna be it for this video. It's really been a love letter to this monitor because I just uh, think you've figured out by now that I absolutely love CRTs, A, and I really, really like the Commodore 1702 monitor. It's just a sturdy, reliable, vibrant, great image quality, great all around monitor. And to me, the little mod that I added to this thing just improves it just the right amount to make it that much better so you're not stuck using that front input when you're using composite sources. I wanna throw something else out there. As I mentioned with the RGB mod, there needs to be some circuitry designed to convert the RGB signal to the right levels. If anyone out there can come up with a design that I can easily build up on a prototype board, I'll be more than glad to try out the RGB mod on this monitor because it would be kind of cool to have a viable RGB mod circuit that people could replicate and then get these monitors to be that much more useful compared to RGB modding a television set where every TV is slightly different. These monitors are very plentiful and having a circuit that could be built up and put inside one of these without too much difficulty could be pretty useful to the general community. Anyhow, that is gonna be that. So if you like this video, 
Well, I appreciate a thumbs up. Look, this guy here, he's talking about the same thing as the outro, I guess. Uh, thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos. They get behind the scenes stuff, things like that. So uh, there's a link in the description if you want to become a patron. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. And, um, you know, all the other YouTube stuff. So that's going to be that. Stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.